Hey guys. Hey. 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 Nice to see you. Hey, nice to see you too. Good. Long time. Yeah, it has been. Okay, so we have five of us. We're still waiting for Abdel. Uh, and uh, we have the attendees joining. Okay. I would suggest we'll get started in about 15 seconds. If I, uh, let's see, And I think we have a quorum. By the time you finish 15 seconds, it's been 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> So, welcome to the Horace's Extraordinary Meeting and our session on developing deep learning while in isolation. And I think as we can see from the camera, we definitely all well isolated these days. Um, I think it has been clear we are in uh, times of unprecedented transformation. We already were realizing that learning continuously, deep learning are fundamentally important for ourselves, but also for our societies and to cope with the ever faster changing world. The pandemic required us to shift from in-person collaboration to new models and platforms. While it opened new doors, it undeniably isolated us from each other, at least in the physical sense. But we didn't have to start from zero. We can leverage more than a decade of research in digital transformation and online learning. It is clear that the new normal of 2022 will look very different than 2019. And we at EdgeTech, my consulting business, are helping lead us to think through the implications. As an investor, we see and try to seize the opportunities this transformation brings. Horasis is a great conference and I have the honor to participate over the last years um, at the variety of forums they brought together. Today, we have a fantastic group spanning from global enterprise leaders to startups helping war and torn countries. We will look at technologies, as well as the human factor of learning. And we will explore the learning of minds and machines. Please help me to welcome our panel of global thought leaders here at the 2020 Horace's Extraordinary Meeting, focusing on AI. With that, I would like to go around the table, the virtual table here, and do a quick introduction. And maybe we can just start with you, Michelle, because you're directly in the middle in front of me on my screen. Good morning or afternoon. My name is Michelle Moore, greeting you from Toronto today. I'm the founder of a management consultancy called Mind Equity, and we help knowledge worker organizations protect and harness attention because even before COVID, 75% of North American workers were distracted on the job most of the time, and 67% of workers are facing near-term burnout. And so the worry is, of course, with COVID stress and less human interaction, that that's putting AI developers' well-being, innovation, and effectiveness at risk. But we can turn this trend around by protecting and harnessing personal and organizational and collective attention. Thank you, Michelle. Andrew, going around the virtual table here in front of me. Oh, can you hear me? We're good? Yes, perfect. Yes. Wonderful. Ah, thank you so much for including me. My name is Andrew McGregor, and I am the founder and director of a not-for-profit research project called Umwelt. And what we do is we invent uh, wearable technologies to enable animals to communicate to a human when they find a landmine. Uh, so it's basically using artificial intelligence and machine learning tools to create interspecies communication. Um, how that works, actually, is there's a, you should always have a puppet on hand. Um, so... We have a, an accelerometer, a, a sensor that detects changes in motion. So similar to how a Fitbit can tell if you're walking or jogging, uh, we use machine learning and deep learning to develop algorithms to determine when the animal scratches on a landmine. The animal is not harmed. It just This is how the animal can communicate because it can only smell and use its body language to a human who is a visually oriented creature, so to speak, that there's a landmine present. So I think it's very exciting that we can tap into the open source movements and the vast acceleration of the access to data to even do things like communicate with animals. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that'll be the silver lining with all the tragedy and death that's ensued is that we can come out of this better than we were before. Thank you for having me. That's exciting, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, Tufi, you and I have been on the stage a couple of times over the past, uh, I would say, decade. Uh, why, why don't you go next, please? Right. Uh, I should say a few decades, right? Oh. I'm just kidding. Less than like one decade. 
Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Tufi. I, uh, I do two different things uh, mainly. Below those two different things, I have like about 97 jobs. But uh, uh, one of them is uh, I'm the author of uh, Toda IP protocol, which is a network based protocol for uh, value management and exchange. Uh, and the other thing is uh, that I'm focused on right now, I took on a role with the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Uh, and with that, I took on the, the global AI uh, standards uh, for, for building AI standards, basically mainly focus on the security of AI to prevent an attack from within, which is something that uh, doesn't exist in the world today. So it requires a lot of research and whatnot. And uh, what you can envision is that any person who's building an AI, you're building and you're giving it to folks, whether it is a certain government or uh, institution or whatnot, they can repurpose it. If they can repurpose it, they will. And therefore, it could be the biggest uh, a threat on people if it can be used by some people against others. So effectively, how can we build it in a way that... Uh, it cannot be repurposed is the focus of uh, what I'm, tr I'm trying to drive the research with the IEEE. And as you all know, IEEE is uh, one of the largest in the world for building standards and whatnot. So that's mainly my focus with the IEEE. Thanks for having me. Well, definitely looking at global collaboration during the conversation we have here today. But last but not least, Lila, we are geographically neighbors, I think, uh, here in the Seattle area. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, please. Oh, good morning, Mark. It's uh, it's really early for us, and good uh, good afternoon to some of some of you. It's really good to see some of the familiar faces and some of the new ones here. Um, I work for the small company called Microsoft, and uh, um, I uh, I work as part of the uh, CTO organization. And some of the most interesting work that we're doing, of course, um, we're at the epicenter of. Um, what was really interesting when the pandemic started is that uh, in that organization like ours, there are thousands and thousands of people who just volunteer and uh, start innovating in the space. So it created enormous uh, amount of innovation internally. Yeah, and also these people started reaching out. So this innovation started to started a lot of collaboration with a lot of some of the largest universities and even across companies, startups, even the uh, among the largest companies in the world. So um, one of my, my role actually helps all of our AI efforts, whether they are in product or they're completely out there in Microsoft research. So since the beginning of February, we've done some of the most interesting work, both in uh, um, setting up robust uh, pandemic resilience systems, but also a very, uh, very specifically, and actually decoding the DNA um, of the virus really, really rapidly. In fact, you know, we have samples, we're collaborating with multiple institutions and we have uh, samples coming in from wherever the pandemic is emerging and uh, we're trying to uh, do synthetic biology and uh, rapidly understand quantitatively how the virus is evolving, how it's affecting us, who it's affecting and why it's affecting uh, that particular person. So it's a combination of genomics, uh, computational biology, as well as, of course, AI, because uh, that's what we're using to actually identify uh, trends and identify um, um, what virus is doing. So uh, it's, uh, it's been unprecedented times. Um, and of course, it's been in a very difficult time for, for most of us. But at the same time, it's really, uh, you know, creativity loves constraints. And in some ways, it, it generated the unprecedented amount of creativity uh, and pushed some of, the, for some of the opportunities really forward in terms of how we are thinking about biology, how we're thinking about disease, and how we're thinking about preparedness for something like that globally when there are you know, nearly 8 billion of us in the world. So super excited to have this conversation. Looking forward to it. In, in uh, uh, full uh, full disclosure, by the way, uh, in one of the roles, uh, uh, Lila and I was on the same board of uh, one of the companies called Toda Corp. So it's important. To, we and we didn't plan to be here, and it's just like such a small world. That's okay. right. The organization brings us all together, right? right. Yeah, even if we know each other. Um, before, so. We all, I think, were stating that COVID made things different. But 
if I'm looking at my own environment here, a lot of the IT executives, especially the software developers, they're actually quite comfortable working remotely. So is it really that different? And if so, what are the pitfalls we have to look out for when we're talking about remote learning, remote uh, collaboration? Michelle, do you want to start? Sure. So I think one of the challenges is relying too much in the virtual world on asynchronous communication. So I think the importance to maintain or even increase the quality of collaboration and innovation depends on our human ability to listen to each other through voice to voice communication in virtual spaces with our cameras on. You know, I don't know how many meetings you've been to where the cameras are off um, and for having facilitators that hold a psychologically safe space to include all voices that need to be heard and to draw those softer voices out. So what I see in my technology clients are that they, they're instant messaging back and forth or collaborating in Google Docs almost excessively, thinking that relying on this asynchronous communication only is going to get the job done. But once they start to insert, you know, human centered or, or synchronous communication and listening and dialogue, I just can't stress the importance of the quality of collaboration and innovation that happens then. And so my belief is that for quality innovation to continue, this balance between digital and human to human communication is vital, even when in-person meetings are not possible. Interesting. Um, I would assume Microsoft is completely online now. Um, how, how does it look like for you? You and your colleagues. As much as possible. You know, we're lucky and knowledge workers in general are very lucky, right? Because we are we're able to do this as opposed to some of us who, you know, actually the only way for people to work is actually to go there. Um, so one of the things that we've noticed in, uh, uh, in the online world, some of the productivity actually went up. Um, and it's not surprising, you know, um, when, uh, because in a, in, a, in a largely distributed company, you always have somebody who is online. But what happens in that case that, uh, when, when partially organization is online and partially they're together, different dynamics emerge. So the people who are physically together actually at an advantage, um, uh, over those who are, who are physically remote. But when everybody is remote, it, it levels the playing field. Um, and it actually improves, improves collaboration in some way. So we've done a lot of interesting experiments. If, uh, for those of you who ever use Teams, we actually um, brought together this, uh, this new feature. It's kind of an AR-ish feature where you actually see everybody as an audience together um, physically. And we've done it for, uh, originally we've done it because uh, some of our uh, uh, clients that couldn't uh, hold physical events wanted to see the audience. Because if you are an artist or, uh, or a communicator, it's almost impossible to really... Uh, you know, work if you don't see the response from the audience. That's how important it is for us to see each other's faces. This is uh, <laughs> this is to the previous point. So we've learned a lot, and we've learned that uh, it's actually quite um, you can be quite successful and very productive online. At the same time, humans are very um, very tribal in some ways creatures. We actually need to see each other. And one thing that we learned not so much in the company, but as we were helping. Some of the um, biggest corporations, some some governments, to uh, to get through this is that uh, the impact of this uh, uh, of this virus is not just uh, you know what you see in front of you. It's not just the directly economic or um, or medical. It's it's the uh, subsequent conditions, the the effects of isolation. Even though we can work maybe effectively with each other, uh, we still need face time uh, with other humans. And what's happening in the psychological effect effect of this uh, after the fact is, is is actually quite dramatic what we are finding in some of our research. So um, in, uh, all in all is, can we be all remote? Is everything, can everything be remote? Yes, ultimately everything can be remote. Do we want the all to be remote? No, humans want to want to see each other and interact with each other at the end of the day and we need it for our psychological health. <laughs> So I hear that remote working is harder for some people than for others. Um, one of the big discussions over the last few years in the AI and machine learning space was uh, BIOS. Um, so 
by having all of the developers here now in a completely remote environment, how is this impacting how we train our machine learning algorithms? Sufi, I think the um, overall, like IEEE, for example, as an organization, has brought a lot of international talent together. What's the thinking on um, BIOS in AI and how can it be overcome? Well, uh, I mean, on, on the point of uh, uh, how would that relate uh, to working uh, remotely, I feel uh, um, I concur with uh, Lila when it comes to uh, brainstorming sometimes remotely and you're able to look at people the entire time. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit better than being in person because everybody's kind of looking at the screens or whatnot. But some other times you feel that you're not able to communicate as much as you would like to when the person is kind of next to you or in the same room or whatnot. Because I feel uh, part of our communication is nonverbal, sometimes how you feel that the person is feeling about a certain thing, especially when you're brainstorming about certain elements, you're building an algorithm or protocol or whatnot. Uh, now, when it comes to the, uh, the danger that, again, uh, that I feel when it comes to uh, AI security, uh, there's not a single AI developer in the world that can actually tell you that it cannot be repurposed. It, it, every single AI that can be built today or being built today can be repurposed. And if it can be repurposed, it will be repurposed. And if it will be repurposed, if you can start envisioning how the repurposing, like, you know, Elon Musk would call it, like, could be more dangerous than nuclear warheads or whatnot. Uh, it's definitely more dangerous than nuclear warheads. So building certain preventions can be extremely important to all of us, to what we're leaving behind and how we receive this world and how we're going to leave it. So I feel that uh, it's uh, as much as a lot of people would fear that AI is going to replace their jobs or going to attack people, that none of that's going to happen. AI is going to make people's lives so much better but if we don't have security by design in, embedded inside each and every module or whatnot, we might get to certain things that can be extremely detrimental. And uh, whether we're working in isolation or not, I feel that uh, every single person need to know that. And when you know that, then you feel a little bit responsible. If you know and you're capable, you're definitely responsible. So, <laughs> yeah, you, I said you brought you brought up a great point. Using AI for good can make a huge difference in human lives, and I think Andrew and his uh, his project are driving a lot there. Um, but we all know that, of of course, that in AI, the the amount of data and the quality of data collected is absolutely important for the quality of the algorithms to learn. Um, Andrew, I think you're working in a variety of different cultures, so bringing the how, how, how important is cultural since awareness? You're asking, like since the right you're asking, uh, Andrew, I'm actually extremely curious about that super duper fancy AI machine behind him. Would you mind if we get him to tell us what it is? That it looks like it's got some keyboard in it. The, the typewriter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is very avant garde. It's from um, 1952, an ancient American company called Smith Corona. Um, yeah, so it's, I think it's good to have typewriters around because it keeps one honest, right? <laughs> and there's, like, my favorite authors all use typewriters, like Hemingway, and so if they could write the great books with the typewriter, I think we can too. Um, but, yeah, Mark, so your question was about the cultural, the importance of different cultural backgrounds in deep learning creation and refinement. Was that the gist of it? <laughs> yes, please. So how do you make sure that the data you're collecting globally is actually useful for the machine learning algorithms you're using? Yeah, so before the pandemic, it was very important that um, our, our team, because we're based in um, Los Angeles and Scotland, and then the, the data for the animals is actually collected in um, Moro Goro, Tanzania. Um, but we're, we're not making a, a commercial product per se, right? We have, there's like 200 of these giant rats in the world that find landmines, but our, our, so it's hard for people to kind of conceptualize out of a startup or a for-profit product development schema. Um, so the loss of physical travel, because we could take an engineer to Tanzania and then they would work with the deminers so they understand the moral importance. And then they'd be like, oh, and then you also have another stakeholder of the animal, which most people don't think about in terms of deep learning development. Um, so to kind of recreate that has 
been a challenge in the pandemic. And what I've had to do is kind of really focus on empathy. I've, I've lived in several countries and cultures, so I've been able to do that. But to understand that, like, for certain cultures, like, an animal like this is, like, a pest or food or something, right? Like, the, the category of animal is wrong. But for other people, it's like a romantic project that we're creating this, like, Dr. Doolittle device. And so for me, uh, it's actually been far more important than any kind of technical acumen is to articulate the, the grand vision to a team that where nobody has complete technical understanding of what's required because it's, you know, animal psychology, right? You need a expertise in that, but you also need the AI expertise. And then what's the best algorithm to match with the animals? And because we're dealing with landmines, we have to have a, a success rate that's above almost any consumer product. So it has to be right. And the ability to understand where people are coming from culturally and integrate that into our technology development is actually the most important thing we have right now because that cannot be wrong. And the cultural understandings and the implicit moral understandings of why one would get rid of landmines or one's notion of war and things like that are important both for motivation and then also in how the project will ultimately be implemented. Collecting the data and sharing the data is important in the collaboration space. I understand Microsoft provides a lot of the AI capabilities, uh, both for commercial use as well as for free use uh, for the for research. Can uh, Lila, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the shifts you potentially, the company potentially has seen over the last six months in focus? Uh, yeah, uh, sure, I think I mentioned that it's great. Um, so I think I already mentioned that uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, biology uh, and genetic workloads that's coming online, um, very, very accelerated fashion in order to accelerate um, uh, drug development, uh, uh, therapeutics, um, and just understanding disease. So that's definitely is happening. Um, you know, when you talk about AI bias, you're really talking about gaps in data. When you talk about um, security problems, which uh, Tufi is really uh, um, astutely pointing out, which is a huge, huge issue because you can, you can launch all kinds of adversarial attacks. There's a way to attack AI and basically find its gaps, find its blind point, blind spots, which is effectively a type of bias. You can think of it that way. But all of that comes from the underlying data. AI is nothing but mimicking the society, right? So it's a mirror onto, onto, onto how humans kind of, uh, where, where are their gaps in our own world? Um, so one of the things that we're seeing is because it's so hard to collect data uh, when you're in isolation are, are twofold. One is democratization of actually AI tools. So before, you know, somebody got paid to generate a ton of data. Now we just actually launched a tool, launched a tool that allows anybody to contribute data and actually get paid for it. So different economic models are starting to evolve. On the flip side of that, uh, a lot of synthetic a representation of the world. So, um, for example, data that's generated automatically, AI can actually generate data to fill the gaps. So, for example, if you don't have enough of particular type of voice or an accent or, you know, um, kind of a, fa or a face, for example, you can actually generate it from, you know, with AI itself. So, uh, so synthetic is, uh, synthetic data is emerging as, a, as more and more important. Uh, and the environments that you are, um, actually, uh, synthesizing as well. So it's not just one thing. It's the entire you know world that you will you will synthesize in order to train your AI. Um, so so those are the kind of trends that we're seeing that are happening just because you know the old tools are no longer available for us. And those to those trends were already um, happening, you know, like simulation, for example. But uh, they're ac definitely accelerating while we are you know doing it from home. So data, data quality, algorithms, those are key, important, and providing access to it. Having said that, when we talk about learning, a lot of it is inspired by the biological neural networks of the human brains. That's um, right. Tell, tell us a little bit, what do you think is the, based on what we have heard so far and given the focus of where we are today, uh, what are some of the key learnings we should focus on and insights we should focus on? 
Well, I think uh, what we're trying to do right now is build uh, build networks that are networks that are as as big as possible. So uh, if you if you look at the latest developments, uh, these are billions and billions, hundreds of billions of parameters. You know, these are enormous uh, computers. We're, we have one of the top five supercomputers in the world that we're we're trying to make available to developers. Uh, um, so so the size actually uh, becomes a little bit exclusionary. So one of the things that um, that uh, I like to uh, to work on and and uh, and my work and research is try to understand how do we not just build the largest models, right, the largest brains, uh, but also build the smallest ones. Uh, because what we're going to have is not just this uh, 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 this is enormous um, models and enormous algorithms, which are which are really important. It's just almost kind of think of it as brute forcing AI, right? Build more and more neural connections, uh, more and more complexity. But how do you create the smaller ones? How do you create a little brain like a, a, a one of a mouse, but that can very specialized and can be very low power actually? Because if we start thinking about you know uh, what what is going to happen. And with us being in isolation, automating the world, we're going to need to have tons of little brains all the way around us communicating with each other to make our lives better and easier. But that, uh, that space is, uh, is not as well explored right now. And that I think is going to become one of the bigger trains. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think transferring from the human learning to the AI learning, I think there's a couple of points Michelle was trying mm -hmm. to make on that one. And I just uh, as you're bridging to Michelle, I just want to say, if you guys looking for little brains, I can't do this. Uh, I think that's called humble bragging, right? These days, I think based on our experience, I think you are definitely not on the small scale there on the brain size. But it's just just hair. It's tiny little. I'm just saying. Michelle. You yeah, so so I want to bring a completely different perspective or, or to add something to the mix, right? So everything that's being developed in AI, and I agree with with Lila on on we need huge data sets and and all of the technology is really important. But what I see in in the area of work that I'm in is that human actual learning is at risk, and especially I'm going to sort of some somehow quote um, Maggie Jackson's book called Distraction, where there's a whole chapter about the depth of human learning um, being eroded because kids are just Googling things, right, to, to get answers to questions. And there's not, not the level of depth happening. And so when I look at learning and learning in terms of systems change, the, it's this process of acquiring complex new knowledge through thinking but also through wisdom, sensing, and perception of the holistic human body. So I'd like to offer that not only do we think uh, to learn, but we are also getting experiential data from five relationships that we're always in. And number one, we're in relationship with our physical and our emotional self. That's data right there. That's super important. That impacts everything that we do. Number two, we're in a physical relationship with the earth through gravitational pull. That relationship has data in it. Number three, we have a relationship with this visible social body. So the screen that I'm looking at, I'm looking at a social body that I'm in, a group of people coming together for a common shared purpose, right? And we have a larger social body that we can't see. We kind of see through the chat, the people that are attending this session. And that interaction also has data that we're not capturing in AI yet. Then we have relationship with this invisible social field, the invisible. So the social body is visible. I can see your faces. Then there's the invisible social field, which is what is the relationship I have with each of you? Right? What is the history? And that's different on every level. And that's that's a different piece of data. And then finally, there's also the relationship with the physical space that each of us is sitting in right now. And we have a relationship also with the virtual space that we're in in this in this run the world um, application. So this holistic learning is at risk, um, given our heads are also always in a screen and tech intelligence is often revered more than human wisdom. So I'm just going to propose that let's not forget to notice the data from these five relationships, as well as all the thinking intelligence and, and technical uh, data collection that we're doing.
Let me just pick up on the human element you just mentioned. So, Tufi, in your work with the um, with global organizations like IEEE, um, how much is the humanistic aspect impacting the discussions on AI and AI? So, um, so when it comes to security, a lot of folks would think that um, why don't we all like trust a certain entity? And then you can tell this entity, okay, well, we're trusting you with a certain process um, that you're going to guarantee that it's not going to be repurposed, for example. So let's think if that is a possibility. Um, it's been, I mean, if you look historically, us homo sapiens, we've never really seen a single entity that we can all trust. But let's imagine that that entity, we, we're going to find that entity that we're going to trust. Um, will you be able to trust that entity tomorrow? Will you be able to trust that entity next year and so on and so forth? So when you start thinking from that perspective that you're trusting that they will not uh, change a certain thing, you know, without coming and checking with each and every person like from consent perspective. Um, so that might change. And every single person would know that if, when we're, you're talking about like how we're communicating with a machine, like for example, I'm sure you all, aware of Neuralink, you know, that Elon Musk is working on. That's just like the tip of the iceberg. Like I talked about a couple of years ago about the pill being your smartphone. So today, if you feel like, okay, well, AI is on the smartphone. If I don't like it, I can put it away. In about 10 years from now, uh, that smartphone is a pill you take every Friday. So if you're taking that pill every Friday and it's got like all of those AI components, will you give that pill to your children or next generation knowing that you're trusting certain entity that it will not repurpose it. Which entity would that be? Would that be, you know, the Chinese government or the American government or the Russian government or the Iranian or, you know, if it's, if it's a government, if it's a corporation, would it be Microsoft or would it be Facebook? We, you know, it, choose one that you're comfortable with. Would you still give that pill to your children or the next generation? And if you're like, hey, we've done our job correctly, you know, we're trusting that corporation. So, so, of course, if you can envision that you can trust that, you're going to, are going to happen. And that's what we mean by building it in a certain way that it cannot be repurposed by design. Uh, and in, in the same time, it goes down to the cost. Uh, if you're able to spend a ginormous amount of money and time every time you need to secure a certain thing, you, perhaps you do it. But we all know at the end of the day, it's going to come down to economical factors. So when it comes to be secure by design, you're able to do it in a way that it's, uh, it's cost effective that people would do it. If it's not cost effective, they're not going to do it. There, there's not a single corporation. They're going to go to some other method and they're going to tell you, okay, let's just build an ethics group and compliance group and regulators. And we're compliant with the regulators, okay, or with certain ethics, some country or whatnot. But which, you know, we have different ethics in different countries. What okay. we have. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me pick up on the trust point, because I think one of the things when we're looking at the remote world, we are working with, as humans, we build trust in interpersonal collaboration when we know each other. Now that we all moved in a worldwide uh, virtual collaboration environment, um, trust, of course, is a key challenge there. But how do we and do we learn over the last months to unlock global research collaboration in the AI space, the data space? I think uh, Lila made some comments on the, making the data available. Andrew uh, with the global organization. How do we do we see? Uh, are we optimistic about the future of global research collaboration in AI and learning? Um, and I want to open this to the whole panel. I think uh, mm, I think Lila can answer that a lot better than me. So. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to actually pick up on, on what Michelle and Tufi were saying. And, and uh, what comes out of that is really important is that we shape technology, but technology shapes us. And if we're not aware of how of the impact that it has on us, I mean, just look at the phones. Tufi is exactly right. It completely changed our social behaviors. You know, you see people, you know, uh, staring at their phones even when they're having dinner as opposed to talking, you know, talking to each other, right? So uh, so I think that's a really, a really big thing. And trust goes the same way, right? Uh, we're still human. We still operate with the world within our limitations. You know, our Dunbar number is only so big. We only can keep so many people in our kind of 
network, mental network. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, um, you know, we, uh, we need to kind of transcend it at the, uh, at, at the same time. So what we're seeing is that people are actually collaboration is extremely, uh, extremely valuable and, and it's happening even faster than it's ever, ever have before between individuals, but states are now separating and, and pushing people to basically isolate, uh, in a, in a digital sense. We're see, seeing global networks disappearing, right? If, if you look at what's happening with the global geopolitics, it's, <clears throat> you know, the trends are, are, uh, surreal. You know, you, you know, people are actually starting to be it, unable to work with each other. It's like going back 30, 40 years. So the, the trends are, are going in exactly the opposite direction of where the technology is headed. And, uh, um, and we're, we're sort of not, uh, not, not shaping them, not managing them enough. And I think our responsibility as, as actually being in the middle of, of this technical, uh, technical universe is to, uh, to look at it holistically and to, to voice, uh, where it should be going. So, uh, but I want to give, give some time to others to, uh, to talk about how they see it. Uh, yeah, may, may I add something? Um, so I'm currently working with a, a lone PhD doing robotics projects, um, and environmental sensors and many of them, have applications to our COVID world. So COVID has created this shared threat that's kind of politically agnostic, right? We're all suffering from it. And from what I'm seeing on like the basic R&D level in academia is a, a, a huge drive and a push to improve the quality of data and the benchmarks around data, and then to make sure everyone gets it. Um, and before that wouldn't be the case so much. People would be like, should I license this or should I publish the paper or did, you know, how, as a professor, what am I going to do with this? But now the pandemic has created this force. It's, it's like, we're all dealing with the same tidal wave at the same pressure. I mean, certain countries are better than others. And so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm developing technology in a smaller group with that desire of pushing it out to be of the most service to humanity as quickly as possible, whether it's the private or the public sector. Yeah. Um, as we're uh, getting closer to, to the ending of our session, um, I want to think about uh, going one more time around the, uh, the, the room and our virtual table here and say, what are the, what are, do you think the people that are participating here from the broad Horasis community should take with them as they go back into their environment from a, from finance to development to real estate to any kind of so they have a very politics a very very broad background what are the key things they should take with them about ai specifically but also learning with ai michelle do you want to start Sure. So I'm going to quote, I don't know who said this, but um, some ancient person, knowledge without wisdom is like water in the sand. So let us acknowledge that we continue to have to cultivate tapping into wisdom for better learning. And we can only do this if we balance the digital and the physical, if we balance wisdom and intelligence, and if we protect and harness our attention. So it's not only about data and intellect, it's about tapping into collective wisdom of a team, of humanity, of a system. And it's the aggregate of those five relationships and primary knowing and, and knowledge as well and data as well. So let's look at building holistic deep learning from a human perspective. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, yeah, I would say that um, AI is very impressive and powerful, but it's ultimately a tool of statistical analysis. And it's beholden to the morality and the, the cultural flavor of its creators. Like not every country would have seen atomic energy and invented a nuclear weapon, right? And so you have to consider the, the bedrock of what you do. AI is not some externalized like garden that will water and then will either be subservient or will dominate it. AI is ultimately going to be a reflection of our values. And now that COVID is here to give us all a shared threat, I think we have, much like the chase for the vaccine implies that everyone in the world should have one, now that we know of our shared threats and our shared humanity, we can treat AI with the same thing. It's 
an understandable, accessible tool and something we should use for the betterment of all of us. Thank you. And I, I, wish, I wish we had time. I would have debated that so much. I would have disagreed with many different. Okay, you have 30 seconds. Uh, no, no, I just like it's, uh, I mean, it's just uh, when it comes to those kind of things, for example, when you look at ethics, different countries, they have different ethics. When you look at morals, different morals, and uh, AI is being built in a way that, that uh, we're, we're a lot more powerful than all of us. Uh, and uh, debatedly, it is more powerful than all of us in so many different ways. And AGI is approaching so fast that it's just learning on its own, evolving on its own. Uh, so from that perspective, I feel like uh, th there needs to be certain commonalities that we look at and we agree on. Like, for example, all of us, we care about like cleaner water. All of us, we care about oxygen and so on and so forth, as opposed to look at like morals and ethics and whatnot, because those we're never, ever going to agree to the same thing. So it's, it's better to start from commonalities as opposed to different uh, views on things. But anyway, my time is up. Misha. Thank you very much. Laila, please wrap it up for us. Um, I think we're in unprecedented times and we have unprecedented tools, uh, but AI is just a tool. Um, just like any any other tool, we can use it for better, you can use it for worse, but at, the, at, at least we need to really, really understand, uh, understand it and apply it in areas where we really, really need it. Like everybody here said, uh, we have huge problems to deal with, climate, uh, water, pandemic. Um, and uh, the opportunity here is to really come together and figure out how to solve those problems, whether it's AI or any other technology that we have at our disposal, uh, as, as quickly and as jointly as possible. And for that, we need to abstract and look at the big picture, look at the outcomes. Where are we going as opposed to where we are today and next step? And, and where, where should we apply our attention? Where should we spend our time as humanity, uh, and, and, uh, together as to make this place a, a little bit better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Lila. Lila, it was an absolute pleasure uh, having you, Michelle, Andrew, and Tofi here with me this morning for me, and I think evening for some other people, uh, and discuss these very, very critical questions. I think we had an opportunity to look at the invisible structures of attention from a human perspective, from a technology perspective, and how we can bring all of this together for the benefit of humanity. So thank you very much, and uh, I wish you all a fantastic rest of the Horasis event. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Thanks, guys. It's a pleasure. Take care. Well, how do we turn this thing off? I'm looking for the exit button. Yeah, I think we just have to, to close the browser or just like... We're just leaving. Here. I'm, I'm, I'm just leaving. <laughs> Take care, guys. <laughs> it was, it's, it's a pleasure working with you, and hopefully, I'm sure we can see each other again. Yeah, it was great meeting all of you. Yeah, see you later. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Take care, okay? Bye bye.